We live in a throwaway world. Just think about the last time it is that you had something that was partially broken or in need of repair, and it was actually worth getting fixed instead of just throwing it away and buying something new. Now, this nature of our throwaway world pervades even the way that we treat people. We come up with all kinds of reasons to ignore one another, to toss people aside who no longer are of any use or are too great a burden upon ourselves. And sometimes we feel the nature of our world, our throwaway world, operating against us, that we feel tossed aside forgotten, dismissed, unloved. Yet, in the midst of our throwaway world, our Lord Jesus is building something that he intends to make last forever. And in order to understand the radical difference this brings into the world, not only in our individual lives, but through the church into the world at large, We're going to consider some of the examples from earlier in John's gospel to make sense of what our gospel reading is saying. And in considering these three examples, we're going to see an even even greater depth of meaning to the words of our gospel reading today we find in verses 15 and 16, which I'll read again for you. No longer do I call you servants. For the the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me. But I chose you. And appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And that your fruit should abide. So that whatever you ask the father in my name he may give it to you. Jesus chooses the throwaways. Jesus chose you. Jesus chose me. Jesus even throws away the throwaways from this thrown away world. Even the people who we ourselves are throwaways, even the people that we toss aside, Jesus seeks out and chooses. The first example we're going to look at is the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4. Now, how had she been tossed aside? Well, she didn't have many rights as a woman in, in marriage at that time, and she had been tossed aside by four husbands and sidelined by the current man that she lived with because he was not her husband. So how did Jesus choose her? She didn't go off searching for Jesus. Instead, Jesus planted himself next to a place where he knew she would come. At the well to gather water. Something she must do. And he waited for her there and then revealed who he was to her. And through this revelation, she indeed bore fruit. In the following verses, she goes and tells everyone in the town she's from about this man who told her everything she ever did. And then many of those people come out to meet Jesus and hear Jesus' words. And because of his words, the text tells us they believed in what he said. The second example is the man who's blind from birth in John chapter 9. A beggar off to the side, dismissed, discounted, often walked past and ignored. You know it, we've done it. But because he was born blind, many people even discounted him further by assuming that either it was a result of some wrong he had done or his parents, even Jesus' disciples, voice this question when they see him. They say to Jesus, who sinned, him or his parents, that he was afflicted in this way? But Jesus chooses him. And he explains to his disciples that it isn't because of any sin but, quote, that the works of God might be displayed in him. The power of God made perfect in his weakness, and Jesus walks up to the man and makes mud with his saliva and anoints his eyes with it, and a man who's never seen in his entire life can now see. And what kind of abiding fruit does this bear? 
Well, as you can imagine, as somebody who's posted in a similar place every day, everybody knows who he is, and he's blind. They all of a sudden see him walking around, and he's not blind. Might be asking some questions. And they ask him, how is it that you are no longer blind? And he tells them. Tells them about this man who just walked up to him and spoke to him and spit on some dirt and rubbed it on his eyes, and all of a sudden he can see. And there's a really cool account following that as his faith grows, because then he's brought before the Pharisees who accuse this man who's helped him of violating the Sabbath, and he defends Jesus by saying, I couldn't see before, and now I can see. And we know that God does not listen to sinners. And so many people came to believe in Jesus based on what he had said about how Jesus had changed his life. And the last example is the paralytic at the pool of Bethesda, outside of this, just inside the Sheep's Gate of Jerusalem. Now, if you've seen the, the, the show The Chosen, there's a very powerful scene in season two about this interaction between Jesus and this man. And in the episode, they try to fill in a little bit more of the context of what it would be like for somebody who's paralyzed and has been paralyzed their whole life, and desperately trying to get into this pool based on a belief that when the water was stirred up, the first person who would be able to get in the water would be healed. And yet, he never could get there first. Tossed aside. Tossed aside even by the other people who are in their affliction. The way they show this in the episode is there's religious leaders that are within eyesight of this guy and nobody pays any attention to him. So much so that when Jesus walks up to him and starts to talk to him, he says, me? You're asking me a question? Because he's so used to people ignoring him, tossing him aside. But not Jesus. Jesus chooses him. And he comes up to him and asks him, would you like to be healed? And then he heals him. And again, fruit is born by all those who witness this and then all those whom he speaks to. Because his life is changed forever. The way they explain the picking up the mat in the chosen episode, because Peter tells him, well, pick up your mat. And he says, well, why is that important? He said, well, because you're not coming back here. That life is over. Well, dear friends in Christ, the church today, I think, in the West especially feels thrown away. Especially for our older members, you can remember a time when we played a much more prominent role in our culture and our society, where we were welcomed in many more places than we find ourselves welcomed now that we can at times feel like the man by the pool at Bethesda, the blind beggar, and the woman at the well. Our congregations are shrinking. Our influence is dwindling. We're disregarded by the world. And like the paralyzed man, often we feel like we're engaged in a futile task. We just can't quite get there. Other people get in the way. Nobody's listening. And the temptation is to think that that's new. But what we learn from our gospel accounts and what Jesus tells us today in our gospel reading is that's not new. That's the nature of our world, to toss things aside. We find that maybe uncomfortably true about our own individual natures. How easily we toss people aside or things aside The church used to maybe be the center of the individual lives of its members in a way that we have forgotten because we've been drawn away by the world and all of its immediate pleasures. But this is precisely the situation that every Christian finds themselves in until Jesus comes along. It's the nature of our world. It's what happened to The woman at the well, she was just going about her day, living in the misery of our throwaway world, tossed aside and forgotten, 
thinking to herself even of being no consequence. And who should she find waiting for her at the well but the very Son of God Himself, specifically there to see her and to talk to her. It's the situation that the blind beggar felt. Imagine the feeling of always being ignored and simply walk past. And then all of a sudden someone comes up and answers your greatest prayer. Maybe a prayer that you've given up even saying a long, long time ago. And makes it so that you can see. And this is certainly the feeling of the paralyzed man by the pool. Expressed well in the chosen episode, Jesus says, I have a question for you. And he says, me? Well, I'm listening, but I don't have many answers. And he kind of rolls his eyes and scoffs at the interaction, thinking, here we go again. But then something different happens this time. Of course, because this isn't just somebody, it's Jesus. Jesus walks past all the groups of people that have just sort of faded this guy into the background, walks right up to him, and heals him. He gives him a hope that even the man himself had given up on. And if we're honest, at times, we know the feeling. Cynical and jaded about the mission of God, the power of His Word and the Gospel. Overcome by this throwaway nature of our world we find ourselves in. Nobody cares. Nobody really wants to know. When they ask me how I'm doing, it's a throwaway question. They don't really want to know, because if I start to tell them, I can tell they're annoyed. I was just supposed to say good and move on. Not so with Jesus. He really wants to know. He really does know. And despite all that, he walks right to you. And he knows your name. He knows all of what you've gone through. In this scene from The Chosen... The paralyzed man begins to describe his plight. And he says, I'm having a really bad day. And Jesus' response is, you've been having a bad day for a long time. He knows. That's why he's there. But in each of these examples, and even in the example of your own life, an even greater irony can be met when you think about this in each of these situations And the irony becomes apparent when you ask the question, who has more reason to throw away this throwaway world than God? And the answer to that question is, no one. He made it perfect, gave us everything we could ever need, and instead we turned away from Him in disobedience. We wrecked and ruined ourselves and the rest of creation. And it would have been totally fine morally justified, and even now to us makes sense for God to wash His hands of it, toss it away, and start with something new. But He doesn't. He sends Jesus, promised from the very beginning, to do exactly the opposite. Which makes sense. The throwaway nature of our world is a result of sin. God didn't intend to make the world a place that would pass away, but instead one that would endure forever. And so he sends Jesus in love to make it happen, to restore what was broken, to mend what was destroyed, not to discard it and go with something new. And the reason we're given in our Bible readings today, you heard one word more than any other. Why would God do that? Because He loves you. That's the only part of the reasoning we're given. The main part is it's motivated by love. Love is why Jesus went to those three throwaway people whom the world had forgotten and who themselves had given up. 
and knew them and saw them and loved them and healed them. Because even the people who are ignored by our throwaway world, even them, God loves and sends Jesus to choose them. Do you feel thrown away? Maybe you're feeling this way right now. Or maybe you felt this way in the past. If you haven't yet felt this way, you will, because it is the nature of our world to toss things aside once they use up their usefulness. We can see this even in the church. We naturally get more excited about the new members that's a young family with four kids. The 87 year old, what do they have to offer us in our congregation? Why couldn't God bring us someone younger? Well, you should serve more. That'll be better for us. If you don't serve, what good are you? These are all things that our world says, but not God. Week in and week out, the thrown away gather here in his house, and he reminds us that he knows our names. He knows your struggles, your pains, the bad day that you've been having for a long time. And you confess those things. And some of the things we confess, only you know in, in, the, in your heart. You would think, if somebody told me that, I'd be done. And we're afraid that that's the answer we're going to hear from God. Oh, now I really know you. I don't want anything to do with you. But instead, he sends Jesus. And he chooses you. And he mends what is broken. And he puts the pieces back together of your shattered life. Because he intends in the midst of this throwaway world to make something that is going to last forever. Now, I'm going to read this part of our gospel reading again. And as I read it, I want you to remind yourselves that it's talking about you. That Jesus walked right past a room full of people who ignore you, full of the people who've cast you aside in a world that often casts you aside. And he walks right up to you and starts to talk to you. Yes, you. No longer do I call you servants. For the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Dear friends in Christ, we can learn from the other throwaways that Jesus chose. How did they bear fruit? They told people about what Jesus had done for them, how him walking up to them, choosing them seemingly from random when no one else would pay any attention to them, changed their lives forever. So I leave you today to contemplate a couple of reflective questions. How has God chosen me? Ask yourself that question. How has Jesus' choosing of me changed my life? Dear friends in Christ, when you have your answer to those questions, the fruit will begin to bear all on its own, just like it did for all those whom are chosen by Jesus. Because once he came into their lives, everything changed. The old life was over, and a new life had begun, a life where what was broken has been mended and what was wounded has been made whole, and what was passing away will now live forever. In the name of Jesus, amen.